Hey, uh, my name is Molly Crabapple. Uh, I'm an artist and a journalist who has spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico covering both the aftershocks of Maria and the aftershocks of the Ricky Renuncia movement, a series of beautiful protests that last summer brought down a corrupt and mendacious governor. And I am so honored and I'm so thrilled and I'm so excited to be here to help discuss one of my favorite books about Puerto Rico, Aftershocks. Puerto Rico before and after the storm. Uh, this is an anthology by two um, scholars who kind of need no introduction, uh, but I'll introduce them a bit later. Yarmar Bonilla and Marisol Lebron. And this book is the first book I've ever read that's just like direct, straight from the archipelago voices of activists, artists, uh, journalists, people who um, lived the storm and the aftermath and also the other storms of austerity and colonialism. It is um, a raw, real, and dazzling who's who of the revolutionary culture of the island. And I encourage everyone to, to buy a copy. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce the uh, two people with which I'm going to be speaking this evening. Marisol Lebron is the assistant professor of Mexican American and Latina Latino studies at the University of Texas in Austin. She's the author of Policing Life and Death, Race, Violence and Resistance in Puerto Rico, and the co-editor of Aftershocks of Disaster. She is one of the co-founders of the Puerto Rico Syllabus, a digital resource examining Puerto Rico's debt crisis, and a digital editor of The Abusable Past, a site dedicated to radical historical praxis. Yarmar Bonilla is a professor in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino Studies at Hunter College and the PhD program in anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She is the author of Non-Sovereign Futures, French Caribbean Politics in the Wake of Disenchantment and the co-editor of Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm, as well as a founder of the Puerto Rico Syllabus Project. In addition, Yaramar is a prominent public intellectual, uh, check her out on Twitter, and a leading voice uh, in Caribbean and Latinx politics. She writes a monthly column in the Puerto Rican newspaper, El Nuevo Dia, called El Veven, is a regular contributor to publications such as the Washington Post, The Nation, Jacobin, and The New Yorker, and a frequent guest on NPR and news programs such as Democracy Now!, her current research, for which she was named a 2018-2020 Carnegie Fellow, examines the politics of, re of recovery in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and the forms of political and social trauma that the storm revealed. Uh, the book's publisher, uh, Haymarket Books, um, is an independent, radical, nonprofit publisher, and every single dollar they take from book sales goes directly to support them putting out more radical and seditious books. Um, these events are free. However, um, we ask anyone who's able to, to make a solidarity donation, and that will go um, to support relief and on-the-ground efforts in Puerto Rico, some of which I'm sure are being helmed by people who wrote for this book. Uh, this video is going to be recorded and it's going to be shared afterwards on Haymarket Books' YouTube channel, so send it to your parents if they can't be here. Uh, the event will have live closed captions. To enable captions, click the CC button on the bottom of the video. If you're having any trouble with closed captions, there will be a link in the chat to the raw caption feed for deaf and hard of hearing folks. We will have time for a Q&A. That does not mean uh, comments, not questions. Those will be cruelly rejected. Please post, please post your questions in the YouTube chat window, and we'll get to those later in the program. Um, and with that out of the way, I'm uh, so honored to be here, and I'm going to hand it over to Garamar. Thank you, Molly. Well, I, I'm just going to introduce the, the video that we're going to watch um, a couple of months back, I reached out to the Puerto Rican filmmaker Juan Carlos Davila, and I asked him to help us produce a kind of video companion to the book. Um, and Juan Carlos is an amazing uh, filmmaker in his own right. He has done, he made a movie about Vieques, he made a, a, the struggles in Vieques, he made a movie about environmental struggles in Puerto Rico. He's working right now on a documentary about uh, protest movements uh, in the wake of the economic crisis. And he made some time to make this film that I thought at the beginning would be just a kind of trailer for the movie, but it ended up being a documentary film on it in its own right, where we sit down and, and talk to 
several of the film's contributors and travel throughout Puerto Rico to learn more about them. I mean, several of the book contributors. Um, and we learn more about them, the, the, what, the work that they've been doing, what they wrote about in their essays, and also how they view everything that has unfolded in Puerto Rico since the publication of the book, which included the, the movement to get rid of the governor, the earthquakes, and, and, and the film also touches slightly upon COVID and local protests around Black Lives Matter in Puerto Rico. So with that said, I will just turn it over to the screening of the film and, and look forward to answering questions and being in dialogue after it. I'm Jarimar Bonilla. I'm one of the editors of Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico before and after the storm. I'm in the town of Guanica, on the southern coast of Puerto Rico, where just two years after Hurricane Maria, a series of earthquakes have brought homes, businesses, and the local school behind me to the ground. When we first wrote Aftershocks of Disaster, we had no way of knowing that the title would become such an apt metaphor for thinking about the current challenges on the island. The book is a collection of essays by journalists, scholars, artists, and activists, reflecting on both the consequences of Hurricane Maria, as well as what set the stage for it to become such a humanitarian crisis. We argue that a disaster is never a singular event, but always an unfolding process. In this sense, all disasters carry aftershocks, the repetitive jolts that are felt when state agencies fail, when disaster capitalism rolls in, when individuals are displaced and trauma is compounded. This video features interviews with many of the book's contributors. They talk about their original pieces, as well as how they see the climate in Puerto Rico now, after a huge tidal wave of protests led to the resignation of the island's governor, and as residents must face the consequences of new, unfolding, and seemingly relentless aftershocks. For our first conversation, we traveled to San Isidoro, in the town of Canovanas, to visit the community of Valle Gil, a neighborhood created through land reclamations, which has historically been abandoned by state agencies and is now home to a large immigrant community. Community organizer Janet Lozada, better known as Josie, welcomed us to her home, which also serves as a community center where neighbors carry out meetings, workshops, and after-school programs. During our visit, we talked to Patricia Noboa, a psychology professor at the University of Puerto Rico, who established a legal and psychological clinic here after visiting the community with a medical brigade in the wake of Maria. Había gente con problemas, muchos problemas en la piel, úlceras en la piel, particularmente cuando nosotros llegamos, que yo llego aquí en octubre, que fue el peor mes en Puerto Rico, eh, esto aquí hubo como 15 pies de agua y los pozos sépticos, ¿verdad?, eh, se desbordaron, así que la gente que estaba aquí nadó en mierda. Este, entonces, pues, esa, si, había, si tenían alguna herida, pues esas heridas se infectaron. Aquí hubo gente que murió por leptospirosis, hubo personas que también murieron eh, porque, ¿verdad?, eh, decidieron que no, no iban más. Eh, así que hubo gente que se suicidó, eh, particularmente se ahorcaron. Así que eh, yo lo que sentía era que, que era demasiado lo que escuchaba de parte de ellos, porque lo que yo hice, mi rol en las brigadas de salud era un rol de, de abrir un espacio para la escucha. Así que, eh, y darle un lugar a, a ¿verdad? lo que ellos estaban viviendo, eh, sin mediar diagnósticos, sino realmente escuchar el sufrimiento de parte de ellos. Para mí era bien importante eh, ubicarme en un espacio de escucha. Cuando yo hablo de un espacio de escucha, es literalmente abrir un espacio para que la gente narrara. As psychoanalysis opens a space for human beings to calm their anguish through words, it also makes it possible for another person to respectfully listen without giving a diagnosis or prescribing anything. La psicología tiene que ser un poco más crítica sobre 
qué, eh, eh, qué discursos, qué conceptos, qué significantes van a utilizar para eh, eh, en, entender o analizar la, eh, la historia de la gente, ¿verdad? O de las causas eh, de dolor de la gente o lo que le provoca dolor a la gente. Porque sin querer este, promovemos este, discursos ortopédicos, como dice mi maestro Willy Apolón, y yo lo veía con algunos de mis colegas eh, cuando escuchaban... Eh, cuando veían a una persona, tú sabes, bien abrumada por lo que estaba viviendo, pues tú puedes, tú, tú vas a ver que tú vas a poder. Mira, tú no sabes. Parte de esos discursos hegemónicos que el gobierno obviamente produjo pues, para, eh, para evadir su responsabilidad eh, institucional, gubernamental, eh, la ministerial, pues entonces... Eh, de alguna manera lo que se promovía era que el proceso de recuperación empezaba con uno y, y uno tenía ¿verdad? El, el deber este, de, de hacer algo. Y, y déjame decirte, en psicoanálisis nosotros pensamos ¿verdad? Que, hay, que hay una responsabilidad individual, eh, yo, no, yo no pongo duda de, en eso, o sea, hay una, responsa, una responsabilidad pero eso no quiere decir que toda la responsabilidad del proceso de reconstrucción cae en el, en el, en el sujeto, ¿verdad? Este, y entonces pues a mí me parecía que era un discurso acomodaticio por parte del gobierno que excluía, que, que se sacaba de la ecuación, ¿ves? se sacaba de la ecuación para que entonces los eh, seres humanos, ¿verdad? además de sufrir, tenían que tener la responsabilidad y eso se torna, la responsabilidad de la recuperación, y eso se torna en la vida psíquica de la gente, eso se torna en mayores exigencias para la gente. For our next interview, I headed to my alma mater, the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras, a public institution which has been on the front lines of battles against austerity in recent years. There, I had a conversation with Benjamin Torres Gotay. Benjamin is a seasoned journalist, novelist, and a weekly columnist in the local newspaper El Nuevo Día. His life was hanging by a thread. But when I asked him how he was coping with the dire situation, how he felt, what he expected from the authorities, if he, if he did in fact feel, feel abandoned, how he expected to provide for his son and for his mother, He always gave the same answer. Estoy bastante cómodo. He said, I'm quite comfortable. Yo escribí un texto eh, que básicamente, en el que básicamente reflexionaba sobre mis experiencias, eh, precisamente cubriendo eh, la recuperación después del huracán María, eh, las entrevistas con personas que lo habían perdido todo, que estaban esperando eh, ayuda de las autoridades que la ayuda eh, en algunos casos se tardó, en otros casos no había llegado todavía cuando yo hablé con las personas. Tú hablas mucho de, y el título de la contribución es de que la gente te decía que estaban cómodos. ¿Cómo era eso que te decían que estaban bastante cómodos? Encontré mucha gente que no había recibido ayuda que le permitiera eh, re, recuperar o resarcir los daños que había sufrido por el huracán y que sin embargo eh, le costaba o, o no lograban articular eh, una, una queja a eso, una, una, una crítica a no haber recibido la ayuda que realmente necesitaba. Naturalmente, la inmensa mayoría de la población pues, eh, le cuesta eh, criticar a Estados Unidos, le cuesta criticar al, al poder imperial. Eh, y mucha gente, pues, cuando recibe un poco, pues, se siente agradecido de eso, porque piensan que si no fuera por Estados Unidos no recibían nada. Quizás estaban autoprotegiendo ellos mismos y, y temiéndole a la revelación de que después de todo lo que se nos ha inculcado toda la vida, a la hora de la verdad, a la hora en que Puerto Rico pasa su momento más crítico, eh, ese todopoderoso estadounidense americano no, no, no estaba ahí para asistirlo como, como siempre se nos hizo creer que iba a ser el caso. Obviamente la relación de Puerto Rico y Estados Unidos desde el primer momento está fundamentada en la premisa de que los puertorriqueños somos inferiores a los estadounidenses y que necesitamos que ellos nos, nos guíen, nos protejan, nos cuiden, etc. Esa ha sido la política estadounidense desde el primer momento, una política incluso con, con consonancias raciales y racistas. 
los, los, los nativos de allá no están capacitados para gobernarse, no están capacitados para incluso para ser parte de nuestra federación de, de Estado. Hay que mantenerlos allá aparte bajo unas condiciones diferentes. La diferencia con Donald Trump es que él eh, lo manifiesta abiertamente, lo dice, lo verbaliza, eh, en parte porque, porque pues esa es su idea de, de, de lo que somos nosotros, ¿no? Y, 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 y no lo disimula como lo disimulaban, como lo disimularon, como lo disimularon otros. Esta es la libreta donde estaban escritos la mayoría de los textos que terminaron en, en el capítulo del libro. Y es un cuaderno que llevaba conmigo en esos meses después del huracán, un poco para llevar un récord, ¿no? de, un registro de las cosas que uno escuchaba y las cosas que uno vivía y, y tratar de no olvidarlas. Another person who spoke about the challenges of narrating the personal and collective losses of María was Sofía Galliza Muriente. Sofía is a visual artist interested in the relationship between historical narratives, popular culture, and documentary practices. El, el capítulo son distintas listas eh, y anécdotas que, que yo fui apuntando en un cuaderno que llevaba conmigo en esos meses. Eh, pues, por un lado, para no olvidar, como para asegurarme de no olvidar eh, experiencias vividas y cosas que, que uno escuchaba en esos meses y también para, para de alguna forma enfocar eh, eh, en, en momentos donde, donde era súper triste bregar con, la, con lo enorme de la pérdida, pues al menos tratar de, de pensar ¿no? eh, en, en, qué, en qué se podía ganar. Things I'm happy Maria took. Fences, billboards, stoplights, my schedule, normality, in quotes, and the shame in being sad. El título sale de una conversación con un amigo en medio de todos los esfuerzos de respuesta eh, al huracán que estaban ocurriendo en esos meses después del huracán. En algún momento él me estaba contando de, de algo que, de lo que él había sido parte y me dijo, pues, otros está desordenado. ¿no? Y para mí fue como genial porque sí hablaba de cómo estábamos todos haciendo lo que podíamos, ¿no? pero era un desorden de gestos y de esfuerzos. Eh, y, y constantemente insuficientes, ¿no? Pero, pero cada cual ofreciendo lo que tenía y lo que podía. Algo que te quería preguntar, porque me gusta mucho de tu capítulo y también se ve en, en otro de los capítulos del libro, eh, lo difícil de narrar ese momento, ¿verdad? Periodistas hablan de la dificultad de que tenían las personas que entrevistan pa para que esas personas abrieran y, y pudieran narrar lo que habían visto. Eh, eso fue parte también de lo que te llevó a hacer listas y estas pequeñas anécdotas que no son realmente un ensayo como tal. Sí, es casi como, o sea, yo por ejemplo, yo no soy escritora, yo mayormente mi trabajo es visual y trabajo con una cámara, pero en el contexto del huracán y de, y de todo lo que estaba pasando era bien difícil para mí hacer imágenes, ¿no? Como yo tengo fotos que hice y videitos que hice con mi celular pero yo agarrar una cámara profesional se me hacía bien incómodo, ¿no? O sea, me, había como un montón de tensiones con cómo representar o cómo ilustrar o cómo retratar o qué implicaba tirarse a zonas de desastre con una cámara. Y simplemente como que a mí se me, se me hizo imposible utilizar esa que era mi herramienta normal, ¿no?, de trabajo. Unlike Sofía, who had reservations picking up her camera, Erika Rodríguez picked up her professional camera from day one. Photojournalists are there to capture things as they happen. But we have a responsibility to respectfully represent the communities that are allowing us to be there with our cameras, especially in a situation of pain and trauma. There is a fine line between documenting and exploitation. I tend to think before pressing the shutter. I work slowly. I try to avoid reproducing an image of helplessness. Erica is a journalist based in San Juan. In the wake of Hurricane Maria, she was one of the lead photographers covering the aftermath for international outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and CNN. We met in her home in Rio Piedras to discuss the politics of representation in disaster contexts. Esto es este, gente en Ponce haciendo fila, bueno, durmiendo eh, frente a una hielera. Esto fue en Humacao, en el Ralphs de Humacao. Siempre recuerdo este supermercado porque el pasillo donde se supone que había agua, lo que había eran botellones de Pepsi, así como todo el pasillo completo. Eh, esta fue en, 
barrio bubao en Utuado. Es una foto que me gusta mucho, aunque realmente no es porque sea feliz ni bonita. Eh, un retrato de país. Puerto Rico envejecido, con pocos recursos, soñando con lo que va a llegar o lo que esperan que llegue. Otras, otras personas que, han, que contribuyeron al libro han hablado de lo difícil que fue para ellos la producción artística durante ese tiempo y algunos agarraron un medio que no era el que usualmente usaban. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo tú pudiste agarrar tu cámara? ¿Cómo trabajaste eso durante ese tiempo? Pues realmente yo nunca me lo, bueno, nunca me lo cuestioné porque realmente ya estaba trabajando previo a este y creo que en el proceso nunca me cuestioné como que, ah, no quiero hacer fotos porque realmente para mí es mi responsabilidad, es como es el espacio en donde estoy trabajando para las publicaciones que trabajo, sé que estoy en un espacio de privilegio, entonces es como, como yo tomo eso y digo que yo, si, si va a salir representación de Puerto Rico, yo quiero que lo hagamos nosotros mismos. No es que no pueda venir nadie de afuera, pero obviamente hay un, un empoderamiento en el poder contar nuestras propias historias. Mi, mi contribución en el libro es una reflexión al trabajo y la cobertura que hice en María eh, y, y a cuestionar la representación que se hace en los desastres a la gente, no solo en Puerto Rico, sino a nivel en, en, en la industria del, de, de las noticias. Yo soy muy cautelosa en, cuando la gente está teniendo mo momentos emocionales bien fuertes. Eh, no es que no haga las imágenes, las he hecho en algunos momentos, pero creo que son imágenes que me aguanto a ver, o sea, vale la pena hacer esta imagen, realmente yo necesito retratar a esta señora aquí llorando que acaba de perder su casa o teniendo una crisis emocional, o sea, cuán ético es de mi parte, cuán responsable es de mi parte de tomar ese momento o no. Y esto es un debate en el fotoperiodismo, o sea, hay gente que te va a decir, no, tú tienes que ir y hacer todas las fotos porque esa es la realidad y es lo que está pasando. Pero yo creo, para mí, como yo trabajo, yo creo que tiene que haber una, un, un entendimiento diferente, en especial en desastres. Eh, y porque lo hemos visto, o sea, se vio en Haití, se ha visto en otros de desastres donde, donde se hace una explotación del sufrimiento de la gente y de representar a la gente solamente en el espacio de sufrimiento y carencia. Y, y eso no es toda la historia tomando en cuenta el contexto colonial, la historia de la representación del país, para mí era importante eh, romper con esos estereotipos, romper con el estereotipo, o sea, no romper, pero que, que, de, que yo no creara imágenes que alimentaran el estereotipo de Puerto Rico, it's the island of brown people that need help. Most of the aid that Puerto Ricans received in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria didn't come from federal agencies like FEMA. Instead, it came from Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, who refused to wait for a slow and insufficient federal response, and instead organized their own forms of community support. Among these was New York-based artist and activist Adrián Román, who organized multiple fundraising efforts and then traveled to the island to personally deliver assistance. He later produced a series of art installations inspired by the people he met and the objects he discovered during these solidarity brigades. So my contribution to the Aftershock book was a collection of art, uh, an installation, but also a series of work that reflects my personal experiences um, traveling back and forth post-Maria. Um, bringing relief aid. So that series of work that is, is in the book is the first artworks that I created where I started to feel like I needed to express. I needed to, to kind of release a lot of what I was um, taking in. When I entered Digna's home, she had no furniture. Visible water damage was everywhere, and she was sleeping on a child's mattress on the floor. You talk in your piece about some of the people that you met, as particularly a woman named Digna. Um, so I met Digna in one of those communities. Um, her house was, uh, was obviously um, damaged. It was a concrete home, but it was obviously damaged because of water. Um, she was found floating down the street, and her neighbors across the street, they live in a three-story house, and that's where most of the neighbors went to his house, and they saw her in the street. I always went back to visit her, and um, we established kind of a, a relationship, and I've seen her gradually, her health get worse, in the sense of her mental health get worse. Um, 
um, she began to uh, to kind of I guess dementia or you know losing her memory, um, disconnecting from reality. I wanted to capture her story in a way of how Maria impacted her and how it affected her, but not the entire um, cycle of where she ended up. Her name alone to me is so powerful. Um, I wanted to make sure that I gave her that that dignity of telling her story, but but not not having to tell too much. Well, aside from the, the piece around Digna, um, the other pieces that you talk about and, and present in the book are uh, these artifacts, right? And, and this installation that you made with these pieces that you found. The pieces I, that I found were me just traveling through the island, um, again, bringing relief supplies and, and helping out in any way I can. I kind of coined my own term for them called P artifacts. Um, they were personal objects that people were discarding from their homes that got severely damaged. And, um, and I would ask everyone, you know, what are you gonna do with these items? And they're gonna throw them away. They feel like, you know, they're damaged. So I asked them if I could keep them and um, these are one of, uh, I look at these and they look like paintings, you know, wow. um, but these represent uh, the memories of somebody's family of life that now has been washed away, that's been turned into this abstract um, object or even trash to other people. And um, to me, it also kind of represents uh, what Maria did for a lot of people in the sense of erasing erasing identity, erasing our history, erasing our memories. Note for a friend who wants to commit suicide after the hurricane. No one teaches us to accept death because death, that can death, stays empty inside. The great hole of fuck it that wants to devour us. No one explains how we can become part of the impossible new world that is tomorrow. Or how we are supposed to avoid falling into the perfect and permanent under eye circle we call facing the day. Mana, how not to understand. That is the question I avoid with the organizational fervor of a rescue team that never arrives. But I'll tell you this, desire isn't always followed by death. Raquel Salas Rivera is an acclaimed poet who served as the Poet Laureate of Philadelphia from 2018 to 2019. I sat down with him in Old San Juan to talk about the experience of being named Poet Laureate in the midst of the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. In reality, it was like an avalanche, because a friend of mine convinced me to solicit en pleno esfuerzo organizativo para recaudar fondos en una barra de Filadelfia, una amiga me dijo, ¿por qué tú no solicitas a Poeta Laureada? Y yo, bueno, yo no soy de Filipe, ah, eso no importa. Y así me sorprendió mucho que me escogieron eh, y me sentí como a la vez con mucha presión, ¿no? Porque, ¿no? Como personas solicitaron que de nuevo han vivido toda su vida en Filadelfia y no, se, no sabía qué derecho tenía yo a ocupar esa posición. Y por otra parte estaba lidiando con todo lo que estaba pasando en Puerto Rico, a tal punto que el día que me inauguraron eh, era el día que le volvió la luz a mi abuela en su casa y me llamó así como para felicitarme. Yo estaba como así en un torbellino emocional de wow, qué lindo que me han reconocido, pero a la vez como lo había muy ligado a, a todo lo que estaba ocurriendo en Puerto Rico. Y el poema que sale en Aftershock para una amiga que está contemplando suicidarse, cuéntame de ese poema de, que te motivó a escribirlo. Bueno, eh, algo que, que yo creo que tú lo has mencionado antes y varias personas lo han mencionado, ¿no? Es que en la, en la diáspora llega mucha información que acá, pues, estaban ocurriendo las cosas, pero que por la misma comunicación no, no, se, no se veía tanto. Y una de las cosas que más me impactaba era cómo Facebook se convirtió como un tipo de como live journal o como un, una libreta ¿no? así de, de experiencias, ¿no? como personas diciendo llevo seis horas aquí esper esperando en esta fila para la gasolina y voy a tener que dormirme en el carro esta noche. O 
En este caso tenía una, una amiga que recurrentemente hablaba de querer matarse, ¿no? Y no, y, y me daba, y no sabía cómo responder a eso, porque en realidad yo, soy emocional, pero no siempre soy la mejor consolando a la gente, especialmente de lejos. Siento que, que tampoco entendía qué tipo de consolación yo podía darle a alguien. Sentía que era vacío, ¿no? Que era como, ¿qué yo le digo a alguien ante esto, no? Como, en verdad está cabrón, mano, ¿sabes? Yo entiendo, yo entiendo. Yo no tengo nada que ofrecer a alguien, no tengo nada que decir ante eso. Eh, pero sí quería decir como que te veo y está, está cabrón. ¿Y sabes si la amiga ha leído el yo, poema? Yo se lo leí en, priva, en privado. Ella sabe que existe. Y me lo agradeció y nos sentábamos con una escalera y se lo leí. Y el otro poema que sale aquí es del terciario, ¿verdad? No, no. el otro poema que sale ahí es de... Sí, es de antes que Isla Volcán. Ah, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Originalmente me lo pidió Cindy Jiménez Vera, la editora, como un libro para niños. Y me yo como que no sé, soy buena escribiendo libros para niños. Eh, pero puedo hacer como un 13, 13 para arriba, como jóvenes entrando a la tragedia de la adultez. Eh, y en realidad lo que salió era este, este libro sobre el futuro, ¿no? Y la, y la posibilidad de pensar el futuro. Y tengo tantos poemarios tan deprimentes que como que me... me Anthropy Darks, ¿no? que me puse como mente a escribir un poemario sobre el futuro y, y lo que más encontré como en ese proceso era que, que estamos creando futuro a cada rato en Puerto Rico ¿no? pero que nos, en, no, no, en, nos enseñan ¿no? pero sí el colonialismo como que refuerza la, los momentos de, de, de competencia y de falta de solidaridad y poca solidaridad ¿no? y pocas veces refuerza los momentos en que hacemos cosas bien cabronas. Y también que está bien fallar y está bien como cagarla cuando uno está traumado. No, yo lo pienso también como ser queer, como... Para las personas queer no hay una guía para cómo formar familia o cómo tener relaciones, como... Una de las primeras cosas que yo aprendí como cuando empecé a salir con mujeres era que... Yo no soy una mujer, pero, pero sí en ese entonces me identificaba como mujer y como lesbiana. Y me di cuenta que tenía que inventarme una forma de acercarme a otra mujer, porque no existía en mi vocabulario eso, no existía en mi vocabulario afectivo ni social eso. Y que las personas cuidan cada rato nos inventamos cosas, nos inventamos género, nos inventamos expresiones de género, tenemos que inventarnos un mundo. Y que dentro de eso metemos la pata todo el tiempo, todo el tiempo, todo el tiempo, ¿no? Creo que un poquito así es como los puertorriqueños hemos ido creando solidaridad, ¿no? A pesar del de, de imperialismo, el colonialismo y todo, como nadie nos enseñó a, a, a unirnos, como eso lo hicimos nosotros y lo, lo hacemos mal muchas veces y otras veces lo hacemos bien cabrón, pero lo hacemos nosotros. An example of this challenging solidarity process that Raquel talks about can be seen in the town of Caguas. In the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria, a community center based on mutual aid and autonomous organizing, locally described as autogestión, was established to address the urgent needs of the community and to feed them in moments when aid wasn't arriving. The Centro de Apoyo Mutuo, or CAM, was developed by activists who understood that communities must become more self-sufficient in order to survive the impending threats of both increased austerity and looming climate change. There are now about a dozen of these centers. Most originated as community kitchens, but they have since grown and are re-envisioning the very meaning of autonomy in a colonial context. Giovanni Roberto is one of the founders. During the days right after Maria hit, and in the weeks and months to follow, it was the dozen of brigades, the comedores sociales, the independent medical efforts, the artistic presentation, and the help from people in our country and from abroad that lift up Puerto Rico. Giovanni is a former student activist, social justice organizer, and the director of the Center for Political Development in Puerto Rico. Aquí hay distintos proyectos que a lo largo del año se hacen. Uno es el Caldero Nocturno, 
es un comedor social de la organización Urba Pies, que lo hacen aquí en el centro. También está el Cine Camp, que es un cine itinerante. Todo el espacio que está acá atrás, este año esperamos que se convierta en un refugio, así que vamos a estar bregando con la limpieza y la remoción de escombros y todo eso. Y aquí ahora a las 3 o ya mismo pues va a haber un espacio de salud y bienestar, que principalmente utilizamos técnicas de auriculoterapia, este, acupuntura en la oreja, y también hoy empieza alguien a dar masaje. Giovanni, háblanos un poco más de cuáles eran tus metas con este escrito, o sea, como escritor, qué era lo que tú, qué, qué era el mensaje que tú querías llevar y, y cómo te estás viendo ahora tu rol de escritor, no solo de activista también. Yo estudié estudios hispánicos en la Universidad de Puerto Rico porque quería ser escritor, así que vivo, vivo una década de frustración, ¿verdad?, en torno a la escritura, porque sí quiero, ¿verdad?, quiero publicar y creo que la palabra, o sea, estoy convencido de que la palabra es poderosa y la palabra escrita, pues también. Cuando escribí esto me parece que empecé a escribir este artículo en el 2015, ¿verdad? Y, y hubo reescrituras a lo largo de eso, pero yo empecé a notar que había que habían otros comedores, ¿verdad?, y que había otras dinámicas que se parecían, pero que no estábamos no estábamos conversándola en común, ¿verdad? Este, y no le estábamos dando una visión, que yo que otro lado todavía no le estamos dando, y estoy en ese trabajo, ¿no? Este, una visión de movimiento, una visión de que estamos juntos en una acción, en una perspectiva, para que cambie algo en la sociedad. Así que el escrito lo hice pensando en, en la gente que estaba haciendo comedores y en la gente que está haciendo proyectos, que yo creo que necesitamos todavía comenzar mucho, mucho, mucho más para, pues, para llegar a la mayor fuerza. Para, para poder activar esa fuerza que estamos generando en nuestros espacios, poderla lanzarla a la calle juntos y juntas. Muchos de nosotros somos activistas y que también habíamos leído mucho lo que ha pasado en Katrina y después del, del huracán Katrina en, en, en la zona de Estados Unidos. Y sabíamos que puede haber una reacción de emergencia bien positiva, pero que a la misma vez estuviese guiada profundamente por los principios del capitalismo, que es un poco lo que ha pasado hasta cierto punto. ¿Y en cómo...? ¿Cómo desde la perspectiva de los comedores sociales, cómo ustedes han visto lo que ha pasado con los terremotos y la forma en que la ciudadanía ha tratado de ayudar a los damnificados? Eso es positivo en tanto hay vacío, necesitamos responder, nos salvamos, ok. Pero ahora mismo los terremotos son hasta más complicados que los huracanes por muchas razones. Eh, pero tú no los resuelves dándole comida a la gente, ¿verdad? Este, aquí hay una investigación de, estructural en todo el país. Empezando por los edificios públicos a los que está obligado el Estado, pero siguiendo con comunidades enteras que no necesariamente pasaron por los procesos porque no tienen dinero y porque el Estado, sabiendo que eso iba a ser así, lo permite, lo facilita para no invertir el apoyo que tiene que hacer con las comunidades. Así que aquí hay una responsabilidad que ahora más que nunca hay que señalar y señalar y señalar. Y, y en ese sentido este, hay que celebrar la, la capacidad de movilización, pero tampoco... Este, celebrarlo como si fuese autogestión. Yo he tratado de distinguir en, en las conversaciones, la autogestión es un proceso intencionado, ¿verdad? Nosotros empezamos el CAM un 28 de septiembre y teníamos el nombre una semana antes. Nosotros no pusimos una calpa después del huracán, empezamos a cocinar, empezamos a crear y a eso dijimos, estamos aquí creando. Nosotros sabíamos que íbamos a crear una institución que iba a durar. Entonces, lo que está pasando allí no es autogestión, ¿verdad? Y no, no tiene que ver con la autogestión que defendemos, los que lo estamos haciendo como un, un principio político, eso es solidaridad y sobrevivencia, ¿verdad? Y esa distinción, pues a mí me parece importante porque a veces nos podemos ir en alguna gente, ¿verdad? Más que otra, pues en un viaje, de que chévere, no necesitamos gobierno y, y necesitamos, el, la, quizás no este gobierno, por razones obvias, pero necesitamos un gobierno que le responda a la gente, si no se nos van a caer edificios encima de nuestros niños. Yo lo único que he repetido desde que, desde que empezó todo esto es, esta gente nos va a matar. Giovanni's assertion that the government is going to kill us might seem inflammatory, but it echoes a concern shared by many, given Puerto Rico's repetitive aftershocks. While still unrecovered from Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico faced an earthquake swarm with the hundreds of seismic events shaking the southern coast since December of 2019. Shortly following, locals found themselves responding to a worldwide pandemic due to COVID-19. This led to an extended quarantine that left many without income or access to basic services, while the government stalled in testing, contact tracing, and acquiring desperately needed medical supplies. In Puerto Rico, this global pandemic was not experienced as a sudden crisis, but as yet another aftershock. 
another episode in a larger series of repeated traumas that have made it harder and harder to live in Puerto Rico, pushing residents towards migration, exile, displacement, and even suicide. Yet, in the midst of these challenges, locals keep finding new ways of living and transforming the communities they seek to defend and reinvent. The lessons of community care, self-empowerment, and the much-touted resilience that locals have been forced to develop over the past decade has left them well-poised to turn these repeated crises into an occasion for the development of new political imaginaries. My God, that was an amazing film and, and also one that, I mean, now that we're all like trapped, you know, in our rooms and trapped, you know, in different parts of the world, it like brought my heart right back to Puerto Rico as well, like in those days after Maria and also, you know, in those, those days of revolt. So um, thank you both for this work of journalism, but also uh, of memory, you know. Um, so I wanted to um, ask you a few questions that uh, this film and this book uh, brought up for me. And the first one is that there is this popular perception that the problems in Puerto Rico started with Maria. A popular perception, I should say, in America, not in Puerto Rico. They know better, you know. Um, and that the truth is that, that this is a lie, right? Both what happened in Maria, but also the horrific response afterwards come from austerity and colonialism. And I would love for you to talk about the ways in which what happened... Um, during and after Maria are actually aftershocks of far greater um, issues. Yeah, I think for us, you know, that that's been something that has been at the center of how we've been thinking about post-disaster Puerto Rico and even the concept of, of aftershock. You know, we ask, you know, the reader of, of the book or the viewer of the film to think for themselves, you know, what is the what is the main shock and what is the aftershock? And um, from the moment that, you know, we began working with our collaborators, you know, we said, is, is Maria the main shock? Um, is it an aftershock of colonialism? Um, is, is the aftershock, you know, what, what came after Maria also? Because it's not, you know, it's not just about the wind and the rain of the storm, but about, you know, all the fragility that already existed before then, but also all the government abandonment that happened afterwards. Um, and in doing presentations about the book in Puerto Rico, a lot of people in the Q&A and the discussion, it would almost turn into group therapy where people would talk about also their own individual aftershocks, you know, how how things rippled through for them. And and with the, the you know, the, the hurricane that, that just hit the United States um, this week, it, it first passed through Puerto Rico as a tropical storm. And my mom, she was, she was crying and so upset and, and I said, mommy, it's not that big a storm. And she's like, yeah, I'm not scared of the storm. What I'm scared about is what comes after. You know, so I think, you know, this feeling of, of these kind of repetitive cycles of unending disasters of, you know, events that, that keep punctuating and keep redefining what the post-disaster landscape is, you know, and we borrowed this landscape with this language of earthquakes and then Puerto Rico faced, you know, these, uh, this earthquake swarm. Um, where it's not about a kind of main earthquake with aftershocks, but about unpredictable, constant um, quakes of varying sizes. And I think that's how the disaster feels in Puerto Rico. And at any point, you could have another big one as well. Yeah, I think like the, the big thing that we try to emphasize a lot in the volume, and I think it comes through in, in, in the film as well, is really the ways in which this is an engineered disaster, right? There's no way to talk about this as a natural disaster. And even man-made disaster doesn't even capture, I think, the way the deliberate forms of abandonment and and um, e exploitation and dispossession, right? They really had to be in place in order for a storm like this to affect the population to the, to the degree that it did, right? And so I think 
for us, one of the things that we tried to really emphasize were, you know, the questions of what exactly were the conditions and the the structures they created that engineered disaster, right? And for us, colonialism um, was was huge, right? And I think that question of what's the initial shock, you know, I think for a lot of the contributors, uh, the, you know, uh, 1898, or if not sooner, right, becomes that moment, at, at least in talking about American imperialism and colonialism, of identifying a kind of initial shock. And then, if we're thinking about kind of the effects of this long, slow, painful economic crisis, the the so-called debt crisis that Puerto Rico is in, right? That is key to understanding what what occurred, right? I think for a lot of people, it's very clear, right? The ways in which austerity kills, right? And 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 this is what we saw in Puerto Rico. I think this is what you know, even in. Uh, seeing today the effects of Hurricane Laura in, in the Gulf Coast, right, uh, where the petrochemical industry and all of the exploitation and dispossession there, right, that's what people are scared of. They're scared of uh, not the storm, but what's going to happen when the petrochemical uh, plant explodes, right, or it leaks toxic fuel. And so I think that for for folks, that was really key in terms of what uh, contributors were really trying to to point to in, in the collection. Yeah, and if, if I can just add something, you know, I often hear people say, oh, Puerto Ricans can't catch a break. You know, it, <laughs> as if it was this this bad luck, this draw of the card, you know, and if as if it wasn't a kind of problem of, of, of systemically produced vulnerability and, and risk, right? And, and so uh, th- that's part of why every single thing, you know, keeps kind of uh, coming undone. It's because of how it was set up to, to begin with. Yeah, and Hilda Jorens' piece in the collection also deals with this, right? So it's like trope of Puerto Rican as part of the disastrous tropics, right? Like, oh, the tropics are somehow this uh, exceptional space where these horrible disasters happen. It's these stricken people in these stricken islands. And it completely ignores kind of colonial capitalism, uh, entrenched racism, right? And so that's also one of the things that uh, a number of the contributors also pointed out, right, is that... Hurricane Maria was this event that hit Puerto Rico, right? But it did not hit all Puerto Ricans in the same way and with the same intensity, right? And so we saw all of the inequalities that already were at work in in Puerto Rico uh, intensified, right, to the nth degree um, uh, through the, through uh, this event. And the other thing that that um, disastrous tropics makes me think of is how much the initial images in U.S. media of Puerto Rico after Maria were images of elderly, brown, woe-begotten people standing in the wreckage of their houses, um, just waiting for an American to help them. And um, while in no way like downplaying the absolute trauma and horror that people, especially like our elders, endured on that island, that image of helplessness was not true. I, I went um, I went to Puerto Rico about maybe 10 days after the hurricane it was the first plane that I could get on. And like in my friend's barrio in Omacao that people were clearing the roads themselves with machetes. It was not, there was no FEMA, no American government, no local government as well. It was people that um, had to be stronger than anyone should have to be, that then functioning societies should require people to be, but people who nonetheless were strong and who saved each other. Um, and I thought that one of the things that I loved about your book was how many um, activists you spoke to, um, both, you know, people like Giovanni Roberto, who, you know, who wrote a chapter and is in the film, um, but also um, people who I hadn't known, like, you know, just like, you know, older women, right, who, you know, organize their communities. And I want to talk about um, mutual aid in Puerto Rico. And especially I want to talk about how, you um, the mutual aid movements that were founded long ago, you know, during like the student strikes in, um, you know, in UP, uh, first helped feed people after the hurricane and then helped uh, create the groundwork for um, getting uh, the corrupt mendacious uh, Ricky Rosayo to finally leave. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in uh, first. Because I think one of the things that's really interesting is it, and at least I guess speaking for myself as somebody who's who was in the diaspora throughout all of that, right, um, and and somebody who was 
trying to keep up with everything from the diaspora, support from the diaspora, all of that, you know, Adrian's kind of narrative, I think really mirrored what a lot of us in the diaspora felt. But I think this question of mutual aid and resilience, right, that emerges is a really important one, right? Because on the one hand, it was incredibly powerful to see the ways in which, you know, communities were organizing themselves, right? And I think Molly, you did an amazing job of, of documenting that following the storm. But on the other hand, it's it's really troublesome, right? Because I think it shows the degree to which um, Puerto Ricans have come to understand themselves as as people who cannot depend on their government, right? And uh, either the the local or the colonial government, right, um, to provide any kind of assistance, and that goes way before, right, uh, the hurricane even hit, right. That was that kind of mutual aid. Um, uh, uh, kind of movement had already kind of been taking off and then was activated to, you know, full capacity in the wake of, of Maria. So I think one of the questions for us is, you know, how do we acknowledge the incredible work that activists did on the ground and the, and the fact that, that it was activists and not the government that saved lives in the aftermath without necessarily romanticizing uh, the, the, the abandonment that, that, made that necessary, right? Or um, the the demands for this population that is go undergoing tremendous trauma to have to kind of immediately go into triage, recovery, and assistance mode, right? That there's no time to process or, or even feel that, right? Because you instantly have to um, be engaging in the survival work, right? And so I think that that's one of the things that for me has been one of the most interesting kind of things to emerge and is in many ways one of the most enduring, right? Because all of those structures that, that made that necessary are still there, right? And I think that's what we're seeing with COVID. That's what we're seeing with the incredible um, feminist organizing against um, uh, misogynist violence, right? Um, and against domestic violence, right? Because the state is not responsive, right? And so I think this is the tension that's, that's at play. And I think it's something that we're not just seeing in Puerto Rico. So um, I stayed in uh, New York, you know, throughout all of the uh, worst of the COVID, um, you know, when 2,000 people a day were dying, right? And uh, despite uh, Cuomo getting on TV and giving PowerPoints and you speaking in his soothing daddy voice, um, the government, uh, they abandoned New Yorkers, especially uh, poor New Yorkers and especially uh, New Yorkers that weren't documented or who had, you know, other immigration statuses. And... One of the reasons that people survived in this city was because because a lot of people mm -hmm. made mutual aid projects and they fed each other. And on one hand, like, I mean, I did it like a tiny bit of it, but like there were people, you know, who devoted their lives to this during that time. And, and on one hand, I am um, like my deepest respect, you know, for those mostly women who did that. But on the other hand, what a disgusting thing that the government of the richest, one of the richest cities in the world could not support its own people. And the way that our elders were fed was because um, unpaid New Yorkers, um, working class New Yorkers worked for free to go up and down the stairs in housing projects and drop off food for them. It's it's disgusting. And I think it's the same with, um, with Puerto Rico. I remember um, one moment that just like filled my heart with rage was, um, it was after um, the earthquakes. And, you know, um, my father uh, was was down was um, down in Puerto Rico, and he was documenting, you know, mutual aid that was being done in these sort of like, you know, camps for people who had lost their homes, right? And people are driving, you know, and stuck in traffic, or get you know, getting um, materials um, from all over the island. And then a Puerto Rican investigative journalist found out that there were warehouses full of aid. And and to me, that that was like the ultimate thing, like you're so like the only thing that's keeping this together is that the people are fine because the government is criminal. Yeah, I think you make such a good point, Molly. I mean, there's so many lessons from from Maria that we see now in the in the US, you know, with the pandemic and a, a lot of people in Puerto Rico, we've been saying, oh, this is the US is Hurricane Maria moment. Like it's it's moment of realizing that its government will fail them, will abandon them, will literally leave them to starve and fend for themselves, you know? And and I think in the in the film, Giovanni, who is, you know, has has been such an important figure in the movement to have these community kitchens and, and to do all this kind of autogestion or, you know, kind of a, a, a autonomous community organizing, he he makes really important points about you know how we can't let the state off the hook you know and how the state in many ways is depending on us 
to fill in those gaps. Like you said, you know, walk up the stairs to bring elderly their food. Um, in Puerto Rico, folks in, in, in um, you know, nursing homes, et cetera, have been completely abandoned. And all of that, we see it now in the United States, whereas in Puerto Rico, after Maria, mayors were left to figure stuff out on their own while the governor was, you know, MIA. Um, we see in Puerto Rico that that not just mayors, but also governors um, are having to figure stuff out on their own while the federal government, you know, doesn't offer the, 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 the kind of structure that it should be offering. And so we see here how, this, again, this is not like not catching a break or having bad luck or even having a handful of corrupt politicians or one particularly bad president. You know, this is kind of foundational to the nation and to the working of capital, you know, that that there's going to be this kind of state irresponsibility, organized irresponsibility that is going to then lean on um, citizen initiatives. And so I think that is a big question that folks in Puerto Rico have been asking themselves. And I think folks in the U.S. now are asking themselves, OK, we, so we step up, we fill in all these gaps, but then the state continues to operate as is, you know, so how can we take care of ourselves in ways that don't actually help the state reproduce its own power? and reproduce itself as a kind of genocidal state, which is what people were, you know, the graffiti that you saw in the government and the buildings here in San Juan, when people were protesting those hidden supplies in the warehouses, it's, you know, the, like Giovanni says in the film, the government wants to kill us through its irresponsibility. And so how do you combat that politics of death, you know, in, in ways that, that care for your community, but don't allow the state to continue on as normal, which also includes, um, you know, no, the closing of schools, the closing of all public services. In Puerto Rico, we've had, you know, no public transportation, no uh, school cafeterias, no, no food pantries, nothing, you know, a complete abandonment. And then when COVID cases rise, they say that it's people going to the beach that are causing it, you know? So how do we uh, engage in, 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 in taking care of our communities in ways that don't reproduce this kind of neoliberal ideology of individuals having to care for themselves and there being no state role in that, in that process? Well, and the issue is too, right, that even when people are stepping into that mutual aid role, they're criminalized for it, right? So the state simultaneously mm -hmm. wants people to step in and do its job, right? Or at least to condition people to expect or to learn how to get by with less, right? And that's the key, that's in Puerto Rico, that's everywhere as a facet of neoliberal governance, right? But there's a way in which at the same time that it depends on that labor of the ordinary citizen or, or individual, right? It's It criminalizes them. And we saw that with Giovanni, right? Giovanni was arguing um, in the midst of this pandemic to reopen school cafeterias so that, um, low income uh, folks and, and specifically children could eat, right? So that they could survive this pandemic, right? And he was arrested. And so there's a way in which uh, we see this, this simultaneity of a desire for the citizen to undertake that role and then an intense punitive response. And in the climate of um, disaster and now um, pandemic, right? A deadly response when when people actually undertake those efforts. So So that's the thing that's also really, we're seeing that play out, I think, in Puerto Rico, but we're also seeing parallels, I think, to uh, the current protests here in the U.S., right, where people are, are doing the work to take care of themselves and take care of their communities, and uh, they're being totally, um, you know, criminalized and arrested and, and violated, right, and exposed to violence mm -hmm. as a result. Yeah, there's and always been surveilled. Yeah, there's Sorry, always been and surveilled as well. There's always unlimited money to um, crack skulls and never any money to feed people. So on the subject of surveillance, I mean, Puerto Rican activists have, I mean, long been surveilled. Like I'm thinking about like the carpetas. I'm thinking about um, the uh, surveillance and like really like targeted assassinations of independentistas, you know, um, and, you know, in previous years. And um, there was recently... Um, it was leaked, right, that uh, students at the University of Puerto Rico were being surveilled, right? There were a list of students who were surveilled was, was leaked on Facebook. Yeah, so it, it looks like uh, during the kind of um, last wave of, of student um, organizing, right, for a kind of accessible uh, public uh, ed education, um, that the police had essentially gotten access to a number. I, I don't, Yadimar, do you remember the exact number of how many 
uh, account it was? Oh, no, I don't, but it was a lot because it was like anyone who had liked the page, you know, and, and yeah. or engaged with it. Yeah, I think over a thousand, but I, but I, I, I don't feel comfortable saying numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, hundreds of, of, of accounts, um, they were surveilling them, um, gathering all of their information. And then, um, now it's come to light that, 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 you know, people who had nebulous kind of connections, right, were completely exposed to all of this, the surveillance uh, net. So, um, Molly, I know you have to. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm so sorry. I have to, um, I have to, uh, to do some work. I, and, I, and I'm especially sorry, because like, this is the best conversation ever. And I just want to like, <laughs> hang out with you guys and have some rum and like, you know, talk about this all night. Um, but Thank you, thank you so much for for asking me to like speak with you about you know your work, and um, I hope it's the first of many. Yeah, thank you, Molly. Thank and you, we're Molly. gonna stick, <laughs> we're gonna stick around and and uh, answer some Q and A from the chat and uh, keep the conversation going. Awesome. All right, bye guys. Bye. Bye, Molly. bye. <laughs> so, uh, Yadi, we have some questions here from um, from the chat from the audience. Um, and I think this goes with what the kind of last question that we were actually discussing um, before we started talking about the the student surveillance, which I, I do want to get back to because I think it's really critical. But uh, one, one of the folks who's with us was asking, when does systemic neglect become, well, genocide, right? And so I think this is something that we've, we've kind of spoken about. I think it's something that a lot of um, activists in Puerto Rico are kind of trying to grapple with. So what do you make of that question? You know, I think that it, I, I don't think there's a clear answer, but I, I think it's a question that we have to ask of our of our government officials, right? They're the ones that have to tell us, you know, how, at what point, you know, what, what, what do they think is the tolerable, you know, level? And I think it's something that is important to think about in relationship to Puerto Rico, but also in relationship to the 50 states and the communities that are in deep neglect, you know? I mean, Detroit still doesn't have, I mean, Flint still doesn't have clean water, right? And so um, to what extent do these communities that are completely abandoned before the pandemic, right? And and that now are, are having the toughest time dealing with this, you know, as they also try to struggle um, for for better living conditions and and a better sense of, of you know security. Um, to what extent is you know there, there there's a kind of there's the spectacular violence of uh, that that we've you know we're protesting so much these days about police um, blatantly shooting down um, and and not just police also armed citizens even armed minors you know taking the lives of of, of folks in the streets. Um, in ways that are deeply state sanctioned, because you have then, you know, police giving um, uh, press conferences where they say there were like incidents, engagements with armed, you know, mm -hmm. w with armed weapons instead of saying that there was a murder that took place. Right. So you have that kind of spectacular violence that that, that is that is clearly genocidal as well, because it's, you know, diminishing the life of so many. Um, but you also have this kind of slow violence. Through uh, through environmental issues, through uh, toxicity, through abandonment, and and so I, I think you know that that kind of slow accrual of, of of violence and neglect is sometimes harder to really get our our head around, you know, because in some ways we even become numb to it, you know, and I think that's something in in Puerto Rico. Um, so many people arrive now and look around and they're like, wow, Maria really, you know, uh, damaged this place, and then it's it's. You know, it's hard to say, well, what of these potholes, boarded up buildings, um, crumbled ruins, like a lot of that was not Maria, you know, and it's this like slow erosion of, of infrastructure and also sadly an erosion of expectations, you know, so where, where you become used to a certain kind of, of, of gov government neglect and, and, and failure, you know, that, that then you, you kind of shift shift what you expect of it and and stop protesting and i think that's a real danger right now mm -hmm. especially yeah, in in the pandemic yeah yeah i think that that question of kind of how do we reckon with the slow violence or the slow erosion of everyday livability is a really crucial one and this is something that you know i've been thinking a lot about in, in my own work and trying to to make sense of 
uh, like where what's the limit and when does that become like an engineered form of 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 making life unlivable and i think this has to do with everything from the kinds of um spectacular forms of violence the kinds of uh ways in which uh food insecurity is a daily fact of life for a large number of folks but um even things like act 2022 right which is about bringing um you know, people people call it the population swap, right? About bringing um, rich, uh, mostly Americans to Puerto Rico, where they're in their own kind of uh, in Puerto Rico, but not of Puerto Rico bubbles with, uh, you know, butlers and high speed internet and golf carts, right? Mm -hmm. um, living this life, right? In a way that push makes life intolerable and pushes folks out, right? So um, all of these breaks being given to people from the outside when, um, especially in the post recovery moment, uh, Puerto Ricans don't have access to any of those resources that would enable them to stay. And so I think especially for young folks, and this is something I've encountered in my uh, own research, something that I've dealt with with my own family who are young folks, right, um, in Puerto Rico is this feeling that you can't stay, right? Um, and this feeling that um, there is an active effort by the government to push you out or a vision of Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans. And that, I think, emerged in the context of the Ricky Renuncia chats and Telegram gate, right, where they were joking, live, oh, I saw a future, uh, the Puerto Rican future, and it was beautiful because there was no Puerto Ricans there, right? And so I think that there is this feeling among the population where there is this effort to really destroy any ties and claims to place, right, that, that's quite powerful. And that I think we have to think about as part of this question of like, when does genocide, when are we talking about genocide? When are we talking about, what are we talking about when we talk about like actually living in a place, right? So, so that's that. So I have another question, which yeah. is to this, which is uh, what does surviving look like in Puerto Rico in addition to mutual aid? So how can we think about kind of everyday strategies of survival uh, besides mutual aid? Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is a, a, a an important time to think about that. There's so many people in Puerto Rico who lost their jobs and have not received any government assistance here. The you know the unemployment insurance. Um, I mean, a lot of people did receive it, um, but but I, I don't know if it's equally big a number are still waiting. And they you know they they their jobs they either lost their jobs or their you know their place of business isn't open. Um, they might have their kids at home with them and they have no real income. You know, and so I think in Puerto Rico people have you know relied on certain strategies. Um, a lot of family assistance, um, and also, you know, in terms of, of food, you know, a lot of people are growing a lot of stuff in, 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 as best they can. I mean, obviously, you, 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 it's hard to grow, you know, your entire sustenance, but to at least um, compensate for that. There's also a lot of bartering that, that, that goes on in Puerto Rico, uh, a, a lot of, you know, trading of, of, of food and clothes and different items. Um, I'm a member of several swap groups on, on Facebook um, and such. And I think, you know, also, uh, you know, and something that I think the pandemic will do for all of us is to kind of rethink what it is we need in our lives, you know, what we spend our money on and, and you know, how how to pare down the way we live. I think, you know, I saw I saw a post of someone um, talking about, oh, you know, like making home cooked meals and doing all these kind of arts and crafts things. I mean, this is, in, in lots of ways, that's the way we should be living. You know, we should be taking care of ourselves and nurturing ourselves and feeding ourselves. And so um, finding new ways to do that in this moment, I think is, is really important, you know, while at the same time, you know, I always say like, it's still really important to hold the state accountable, especially in, in Puerto Rico, where you have, you know, that kind of the highest sales tax of any U.S. state or territory. Um, so, you know, and that money is going to service a debt, you know, for a, a debt that was incurred for infrastructure projects and such that are that are crumbling. Um, that were often, you know, white elephant projects, et cetera. And so, you know, how how can we, you know, be expected to pay that debt and sustain ourselves and be our own like emergency agency? You know, I interviewed this mayor um, in the southern coast of Puerto Rico. There's all these young mayors that I call them the like post Maria, you know, politicians, post crisis politicians 
and he is telling me about how he he has to be like the secretary of ed because he has to figure out post earthquake where to put up tents for schools, how to distribute food, um, you know, all these kind of government tasks have to be dealt with locally. And I think similarly now, individuals, like we've all had to become epidemiologists and contact tracers and, you know, like figure out how, how to navigate this landscape with such little assistance and guidance. Yeah, 100%. I think that that's like the, the key kind of thing that I think is, actually a really interesting moment right now in terms of also how we can think about solidarity, right? And so uh, being here and seeing exactly kind of these same discussions around mutual aid, um, you know, I know Molly left, unfortunately, but thinking also about um, post uh, what's happening in Beirut, what's we're seeing, you know, these, these parallels are around the globe. And I think they are really powerful moments of thinking about solidarity and shared strategy, right, for dealing with these um, completely neglectful neoliberal governments, right? They are actively causing harm, right? And I think it's up to folks to build those connections um, and create these linkages to figure out not only like political strategies out of it, but I think these questions of, of basic kind of everyday uh, survival. And I think that's one of the things that's, you know, really powerful, uh, you know, I think about the Ricky Renuncia, uh, Renuncia um, protest, uh, the strategies that were learned from Hong Kong, right? And and the kind of parallels there, how do you deal with police violence? And then thinking also um, when there was the Ferguson protest, right? Uh, Palestinians telling folks in Ferguson how to deal with uh, tear gas, right? So, so these kinds of um, ways of dealing with state brutality, they are, you know, either police brutality or the, the brutality of these these kind of infrastructural neglect, right, that, that, that kills people, which is what, you know, we're, we're seeing in, in Beirut right now. Um, so another question we had uh, was uh, actually about parallels between Maria and Laura now, right, Hurricane Laura that's about to hit the, or that's hitting the, the Gulf Coast. So uh, the question is, how might these expectations uh, uh, inform preparedness, right? What sort of parallels do you anticipate and how these expectations support preparedness and response from either local solidarity or, or from the government? And so this is something that, uh, you know, I'm in Texas right now, I'm in Austin, and I, I actually just taught today. I had a student who uh, is from that area and was talking about, you know, his concern for family and friends and stuff like that. And I mean, you hear the Storms, right, and the terror that that elicits, and I think you know, as as you, we were talking about earlier, the PTSD that that elicits for folks who have had those kind of experiences. So think about Puerto Ricans, think about folks who were in New Orleans um, and the Gulf Coast during during Katrina, right? And so I think you know, this question around what what do we expect, and then what's the response is like we it, it's it's the same in which Puerto Ricans what they could expect during Maria was what happened during Katrina, right, where we see this kind of murderous state responses and this or this letting people die right and the ways in which that was allowed to happen through these inequalities that were already existing right and so thinking about um you know the gulf coast and and the importance of the petrochemical industry i've been thinking about this a ton because we saw this with harvey right there were no lessons learned from harvey right so all of that in terms of the toxicity that that's going to unleash on the population plus if we think about that um mm. path of the hurricane being um, mostly black and brown folks who work in that toxic industry, right? Um, and low income kind of uh, 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 folks, right? Who, who are in frontline fence communities, then we're going to see a lot of the same kind of results. But then also this, this issue of this is going to be years and decades later where people are going to be dealing with the results of, of this, of both the infrastructural damage, but also the toxicity that, that it's unleashed. So for me, that's what I've been thinking a lot about in terms of thinking about both Maria, but also thinking about Katrina and Harvey in this moment. And, and like, what is it exactly that makes this an unsurvivable storm? Right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I haven't gotten as much news as, as I would like about, you know, how things have unfolded. But I assume that in the wake of what we've seen with these different disasters and, and, and what we've seen with the handling of the pandemic, that individuals are going to are going to assume that it's, everything is up to them, you know, and that they have to take care of themselves. And just like they have to 
figure out, you know, how to navigate these, especially in Texas, these compli com complicated and contradictory at times um, state messages about how to protect yourself and, and you know, what you can and, and, and can't do and what you, what you should be doing in these times. I assume that they will similarly feel that it's up to them to figure out, you know, and, 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 and measure their own risk. You know, we now live in this new kind of risk society where we, we all have to decide, you know, like, am I, you know, do I want to get a haircut? Do I want to visit my grandparents? You know, like just all these different things that, that now suddenly become a weighing of risk and, and every individual has to figure that out for themselves with so with such little guidance from public health officials or, you know, kind of government officials. And so, you know, we always see this um, with these disasters where people have to decide, well, should I evacuate or not? Um, you know, will it be safe? Will will a shel shelter be safe or not? You know, and so in, in this moment, you th that always plays in. I, I don't even want to imagine how, you know, imagining contracting COVID as, at a shelter might play into this. And, you know, this storm kind of built up really quickly and, and there wasn't a lot of time to prepare. So, you know, I, I have nothing but concern. I wish, I wish I had more, you know, reassuring words, but I think, you know, this is going to be a, a it's already a, a really scary hurricane season, you know, where, you know, already we have so much to, to worry and, and, and deal with with these storms on their own, but to be able to think about evacuating, sheltering, um, assisting your neighbors, all these things while also um, being in the middle of a pandemic that's that's been mismanaged, that's not, you know, that's also been tangled up in misinformation, um, that makes it really, really difficult to face, you know, a, a hurricane season or any disaster. I mean, we also have the fires in California um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a critical time, you know, right now. And so, you know, the, the only, you know, one thing that constantly concerns me is the, the kind of issue of individual responsibility, how that gets tied up to a neoliberal ideology and to um, also pushes for privatization, you know, disaster capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there, there are ways in which um, there's, a, there's a difference between a kind of neoliberal individualist ideology and the kind of, you know, com uh, mutual aid and, and a different kind of relationship to sovereignty that emerges in these moments. And I think, you know, a lot of what we saw in, in Puerto Rico with the ousting of the government was made possible by government abandonment in some ways. You know, some of the people I interviewed, they said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I want to get rid of Ricky. I, we don't need him. We don't need this governor. Where was he during the disaster? So, even though we're letting the state off the hook as the state becomes irrelevant to our survival in these moments, I think that emboldens us to to get rid of state institutions, you know? And so I, I think, um, and, I, and I don't just mean that in an in a anarchist sense, although I'm sure, you know, that uh, an argument can be made there, but I think even um, just getting rid of, of the of the state institutions that we currently have and to reimagine new forms of organizing ourselves politically and collectively. And so I don't think it's in any way a coincidence and in the middle of this botched pandemic, um, people, uh, you know, the movement to abolish the police, um, to defund the, the, the government institutions that don't serve us, you know, has gained so much momentum because I think people have been exposed directly to state irresponsibility and state abandonment. And that, that has emboldened them, you know, in a way. And so, you know, that's because I always try to be an optimist and this is such a complicated <laughs> time. Um, and, but, but, you know, I insist on some kind of analytical optimism. Um, and, and I do think that, that, that we can, that it plays out, you know, that we, that we can see something to be optimistic about in, ter in terms of how people have responded to state abandonment, because they've responded to it by organizing collectively and by making new demands of the state, not by letting it completely retrench, you know? So so to me, that's that's what I hold on to. And I, you know, I think in Puerto Rico, we saw it play out. Um, a lot of people are were disappointed after the summer protest because, you know, anytime you have that this kind of revolutionary seeming uh, politics, you're going to be disappointed when the whole world doesn't change, you know, the next day. It's like, wait, but suddenly everything seems possible. 
Um, so obviously there's been a lot of disappointment and the, the first year anniversary of the, of the Ricky Renuncia movement it was very ambivalent here, and it was interesting to compare it to the anniversary, the first year anniversary of Maria, which is when we started putting together the Aftershock book. At that point, it was impossible to talk about Maria as history because we felt like we were still in it, right? And and then the Ricky Renuncia uh, anniversary felt different because it, it felt like like ancient history, you know, it felt like so yeah. far away. But but I think it also felt really. Um, unfinished you know it felt like unfinished history and like that that there was certainly a chapter that was done and, and over and and not not unfolding still but I think there is a sense that of a new chapter to come you know our our colleague Rocio Zambrana she's been writing about checklists um with the Ricky Renuncia movement how among the protesters there a lot of people were holding up lists of of everyone they wanted to get rid of and everything they wanted to get rid of so the governor the fiscal board the debt um, and that, you know, I, I, you know, I had kind of forgotten about that. But in, in with the recent primaries where the current governor didn't get, re, you know, reelected through her party for candidacy, people started uh, um, bringing back these checklists and, and saying, oh, OK, we got rid of her. Right. And so I think people understand that that we still have a lot of things to check off the list. Right. And. I think just having that list, having made that list, you know, of, of things to do, things that we have pending, these pending tasks, you know, that something that we were missing in Puerto Rico for a long time because there's a sense of impasse and of, okay, we're unhappy with the current relationship to the United States, but we're not sure where to go from here. So, I mean, the kind of purpose that a checklist provides, you know, is, is I think really useful. And so I think that that there is a sense of something brewing. I mean, obviously the, the pandemic, it's not, you know, it's not a metaphor. It's like a real condition where people are really waiting um, to feel safe, you know, protesting in the way that they have in the past. But, you know, even with that, people have done drive, you know, protests in their cars. And just this week, people were arrested in the Department of Labor for protesting the government mishandling of of, of unemployment uh, rights that right. you know that people are entitled to that that, that that have been withheld from them. So we actually have a, a question from the audience about this as well, which is, uh, and I will say as I ask this that I have not gathered all of my thoughts on it, but I think it's related to to this these points that you're bringing up, which is I think like how do we imagine new political futures, right? And how do how do we perhaps even imagine new political futures within this kind of system that is incredibly flawed that we have, right? So how do people work within this? But uh, thoughts on the AOC uh, Velasquez status bill? Oh my so goodness! I, <laughs> yeah, I'm not ready. <laughs> That's how I feel. So I will say I have not um, gathered all of my my thoughts on it, right? And I think, but I I was I will say intrigued. I think by the emphasis of a language of self determination, right? Which I think has um, really not been how the status kind of question has been dictated, right? Or particularly in ter terms of how we think about these plebiscites and referendums on Puerto Rico's status. Um, a question of allowing, I think, Puerto Ricans the process that makes the most sense for them and a desired outcome uh, that is that is meaningful, I think, has not been a part of those conversations. So it's interesting to kind of see the AOC uh, Velasquez bill um, in terms of that, I think that there's a lot of kind of anger coming from statehooders in terms of the way that the options are set up, but I have not completely gathered yeah. my thoughts. I don't know if you have more thoughts on it. Well, one, I think there's a couple of, of well, first of all, we don't know what's going to come of it, right? Um, and, but, but one positive thing I think is that, is that, it, that it has done important work in terms of separating Puerto, the discussion around Puerto Rico from the discussion around Washington, D.C. You know, and so I think AOC has been really clear. You know, these are not, these are not similar contexts because there was a moment a while back when people were tweeting and talking about, you know, I, I can't remember what it was, something like pass it on, like, you know, Puerto Rico should be, I don't know what it was. Um, but so I think, you know, that the, the arguments around uh, D.C.'s, you know, statehood question, they need to be separate. And and so, you know, it's very different to have a disenfranchised terror, you know, district um, than to have a colonial, you know, a, a nation and, you know, uh, right. held, um, you know, in, in, in a colonial status. Um, the the 
it's also, I, so that's a positive. Another thing that is a positive is that I think we do need to rethink beyond the same plebiscite that has been carried out in Puerto Rico cyclically um, with this kind of, that's really just an opinion poll and people vote and um, it's, it's, you know, represented as simple and straightforward, but it absolutely is not because, you know, the way the different um, issues are represented on the ballot. There's always a lot of controversy around how each political formula is represented. Um, the United States refuses to endorse a plebiscite where the current territorial status is not present because clearly that is the status that the U.S. government wants wants to c continue having, right? And so uh, they refuse to have, a, you know, the, the most recent um, attempt at doing a plebiscite that was just statehood, yes or no, the federal government refused to fund it because they said that the territory has to be an option because that's the option for them. Um, so I think to question that repeated, you know, it's like doing the same thing and expecting different results, <laughs> right? So I think to question that and to say, okay, we, we can't, we can't be doing the same plebiscite. We need to do something else. And we need to do something that is actually connected to a legal project where that it will trigger something because it's like we constantly have these opinion polls who cares what wins it doesn't lead to anything and so for the u.s government you know because it's constantly puerto ricans that are portrayed as not knowing what they want and so u.s politicians will repeatedly say i support what 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 do you support for puerto rico self-determination whatever the puerto ricans say um it's like no do you do you support statehood do you support independence do you support uh a Puerto Ricans having sovereignty but retaining U.S. citizenship? Do you support the presidential vote? You know, so I, I think to, to force the U.S. to articulate, you know, what, you know, what Congress would would actually put into place if, if voted by um, Puerto Ricans, you know, I think that is really important because a lot of Puerto Ricans on the island, they keep being asked what they want, but but they always want to know what's available. You know, it's like right. going to a restaurant and not being shown a menu and being like, what do you want? It's like, well, I don't know. What do you got? I got chicken. Okay, but how do you make it? Like, what sauce does it have? Is it grilled? Is it fried? You know, like, these are things I need to know before I'm making a decision, right? There's a reason menus exist. And and sometimes with the calorie count next to each entree, these things are useful. <laughs> the price. Also something I would like to know before ordering, right? So, you know, it's like the United States is this restaurant and it's like, oh, whatever you want, we make it, we'll make it up for you. I, I don't even know what you got back there in that kitchen, right? It's, so, it's the worst so diner. That's part it's of the, the worst diner. <laughs> yeah. So, no, this, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the worst time. diner would have... Yeah, with like a never ending, like 800 page menu. So that's the, uh, but none are actual mm -hmm. options. So, but uh, so it, we're, we're out of time, but I do want to get to this um, last question, which is um, uh, someone asked us if we could provide a list of links of organizations and causes. And so I actually want to um, point folks to our wonderfully new revamped uh, website of the Puerto Rico syllabus. Uh, we just redid the site, and on the site, we actually have a, a pretty extensive list of um, organizations that are doing all kinds of work. If you want to get into environmental work, if you want to uh, know more about feminist and queer organizing, if you want to know more about anti-debt and anti-austerity or university uh, public education organizing, we have all of that stuff um, on, on the Puerto Rico syllabus. Um, so please check out the site. Feel free to follow us on, on social media. I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, Yadi to, to Yeah, so to that. everyone should go to Puerto Rico syllabus .com and you know get their self study on. Um, and the the film is going to have a website that's still in development with you know more information about the particular folks that are featured in the film. But um, you know all, all the all the groups that they represent are also in the Puerto Rico syllabus website. And the film is it's available on Vimeo and it will soon be on the Haymarket YouTube channel as well. Um, you know, the, the film was funded by Hunter College uh, where I work. I'm very grateful to Hunter College because they have funded this film fully and that allows us to distribute it for free for educational use, class purposes, um, community screenings, virtual screenings l like the one we did tonight. So we encourage everyone to watch it and to share it with their friends and, and use it to provoke conversation, which is what we most hope. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this was really great to be in conversation. You know, I always love being in conversation with you. 
and and also it was a pleasure to talk to Molly. Um, so I guess we will leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us um, and for checking out the film and.